song. Very appropriate. Amen. Birds are with it, Calvary. Jesus is very near. You know, if you stop and think about it, we're, without Calvary, you know, what hope do we have? So, something to think about, especially now during this, uh, what we as we prepare ourselves for the community. Um, I, had, I, I, I had this little, oh, I don't know if it came out of our songbook, I believe, um, a little poetry. Alone Christ stood in Pilate's hall, a crown of thorns he wore for all. The cross was borne by heaven's air, and yet they stood and watched him there. The pain and agony to bear while on the cross in sacred prayer. He gave his soul to God's own care, and yet they sat and watched him there. Upon the cross he bore the pain that they and we might heaven gain. His home and love he gladly, he gladly shared, and yet they sat and watched him there. May God, my God, my God, my God, the Savior cried. He paid the price for all he died. Who made his shame so hard to bear? Don't just sit and watch it there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this loaf that is an emblem of uh, Jesus' body that was sacrificed for us even while we were still sinners. Father, we also are so very thankful for all the many blessings that you've given us. And we ask now, Father, you would help us to remember your Son as we partake of these emblems. And thank you, Father, uh, to, and for being with each of us and to cause us to think and, and remember Jesus' death on that cross. Help us to relate to a great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And let us uh, try to imagine his pain and suffering. Help us be grateful for that, Father. We pray that we would eat this bread now and do it in a manner that is good and acceptable to you, our God. We pray all this, Father, in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. There's a song in our book, Fruit of the Vine. Um, what can wash away my, uh, my sins? What can make me whole again? For my pardon, this I see. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing can for sin atone. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing of the blood of Jesus. Let's pray again. Dear God and Father, we, as we continue to remember Jesus, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents so vividly the blood of your only begotten Son um, as it was poured out for us. We pray that you would be with us now this morning as we partake of this emblem and that you would help us to remember the pain and the suffering by our Lord. He endured all for us, even though, as I said before, we were sinners. We're so thankful for Jesus, and we're so thankful for you, Father, for loving us so much that you would give up your precious only Son to suffer that horrible death on Calvary's cross. Now as we partake of this, you'd ask, we ask you to be with us as we uh, partake of the fruit of the vine. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because of COVID, we have our collection uh, box out in the main lobby, so we don't pass, uh, pass the trade around and worry about germs. So, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, uh, for all the blessings you give us, especially, Father, for this beautiful building that we live in, or worship in, and we are um, 
thank you for the beautiful weather that's coming. We're going to soon see the budding of the trees and the flowers blooming. And, and uh, it's just it's a great time of year to, to watch everything just open up and restore all that life and beauty back to us as we come out of this winter. And as we come out of this COVID dark spot in our country, we ask you to be with us and continue, continue to bless us and bring us back to a, you know, to a normal life again here in this uh, United States that we live in. And as far as that, the whole world. We um, ask that as we, as we uh, contribute our offering this morning that you would help us to use it in a way that would benefit you, Father, and to grow the church here in this area. And, uh, and then also to help those in other places that, that we uh, contribute to, especially we think of Indian missions. We have Schultz Lewis and uh, their commodity pickup coming up soon. We ask you to cause us to remember all those things and to contribute if we can to that cause. And uh, again, thank you for the blessings you give us. We ask that you would use all this, as uh, I said, to benefit the church and to you, Father. Pray in Jesus. The song for the lesson will be number four forty. By Jesus I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin.
please remember my cousin's wife, Joyce Wilson, as we pray. Secondly, while it's, uh, I'm thinking about it, we're very, very honored to have Valerie Juarez's mother here today. We thank you that she's chosen to come and be with us and hope that she enjoys it. And we certainly invite you back as often as possible. Uh, thirdly, um, for Carissa's sake, okay, this little baby's breath is because it's for my birthday, okay? But for the rest of you all, I was in McMinnville, Tennessee this time yesterday. I flew out late Friday night and I got back here about 6.35 yesterday evening because a very special uh, friend of mine I've known for 42 years, I did hers and her husband's wedding. She was only 17, she's now 59 and still married. I applaud that because it's the very thing that her mother passed away. She called me on Thursday and she said, my, my sister and I would really love for you to do my wedding, my, my funeral. And uh, I said, you do realize if I've got to fly out tomorrow, it's not going to be cheap. And they were willing to pay for, for the flight and what have you. And uh, this was part of the veneer that they gave me, and that's what that's all about. So ultimately, I've done two funerals, one in South Georgia, one in Middle Tennessee, and the last two Saturdays. Uh, I'm honored. I'm honored that at 71, I still have the energy and the, the ability to do these kinds of things. And I'm honored that I have a congregation that supports me in my ministry, whatever it might be. By the way, I, I see Sister Sarah over here. A couple of weeks ago, she had the, the COVID. So glad she's healthy and back with us. And Joe uh, did a phenomenal job taking care of those little ones during that time. But what you, if you will, I don't know what Joyce, uh, what, uh, uh, Carol has on the board. Uh, is it Exodus 3? Okay, we're, we're right where we're, we're, I want to be at this time. Uh, as you recall, in Exodus chapter 3, God is actually speaking to Moses through a, a, a burning bush. And God is actually, at this time, giving him a great commission to go and to lead his people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. As you recall, the story... Behind it all, there, there was a new Pharaoh that came in. He was not compassionate to the Israelites. He put them in slavery and in bondage. It was a very, very difficult situation. And so God chose Moses. Moses' original reaction was, and apparently Moses had some sort of a thorn in the flesh. And many suggest that it might have even been some sort of a speech of heaven. We don't know exactly what that might have been. But in any event, God says that I want you to go, and I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, and we've all heard this story so many times, to let my people go. Obviously, if God were to speak to any one of us and say, I want you to go and talk to the president, and I want you to tell him to do this or that, our first question is, who should I say sent me? Who is it that, that I could tell represents me, or I represent, so that I could ask them to let my people go. You remember the response there in Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Tell him, I am sent you. Think about that for a moment. God is the only being in existence that actually has three qualities not known to mankind. He's omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. He's omniscient meaning that he knows everything. Not a single person in this world can make that claim. And he's omnipresent. He always exists. From the beginning even to now, God exists. So when he says, tell him, I am sent me, sent you, it was a very powerful statement for God to tell him that. We all know the rest of the story, the templates, all the things that happen. In the New Testament, as we begin the Gospel of John, in the beginning, verse 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We go back to Genesis again, actually uh, chapter 1 and verse 26, and we find out that God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. All of those words, us and ours, are in the plural. Why? Because in the very beginning when the world was created, Jesus was there. And that's why we go over here to John chapter 1 and we see that Jesus was in the beginning. A lot of people don't even realize this. 
Jesus made man. I was working on this lesson this morning. Uh, and by the way, I'm very, very proud and happy to announce that Jacob is here today. Jacob worked a 10-hour shift last night, got home at 6 o'clock this morning. 11. I'm sorry. I need my son to interrupt me while I'm working in I got you, Jacob. 11-hour shift. But he came today because it's his daddy's birthday. And that means a lot to me. But uh, anyway, we're having this conversation this morning. And, you know, and I've said this many times, having three older sons, you always wonder whether or not your children are paying attention in church. Okay? You, you just have that thought that, are they really listening? You know, their, their dad's a preacher. They probably don't want to hear this all the time. And we got into talking about Jesus. And, and I mentioned from Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was in the temple, and he says, I know, I know God. He says, I must be about my father's business. And I'm thinking, he knew that? He could quote that verse from Luke chapter 2? Touched my heart. Made me remember that maybe he was paying attention. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus was God, just like God was God. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus, Jacob, and I talked about uh, uh, John chapter 20, where... Uh, Thomas is standing there, and, and after touching Jesus, he says, my Lord and my God. So we begin here, and incidentally and interestingly, all seven statements by our Lord Jesus concerning him being the great I am of the New Testament, all seven of them are actually found in the Gospel of John. I'm not sure why John took that particular direction, uh, interesting note, and many of you probably noticed it. John's the only writer that doesn't mention anything about Jesus' birth. Uh, in chapter 1, before the end of the chapter, he's full grown. Goes about, you know, the different things that he's doing. So maybe that's why he took a different uh, uh, direction in his whole process here. But we see it here right in the very, very beginning. So as we move forward and... Uh, uh, I interjected, uh, is it on uh, John chapter 6 now? Okay, so we're there. I, I can't see it, you know, and, and I can't tell Karen how much I appreciate that. I know it helps you all out a lot. And uh, this number two pencil on dot com world will gradually uh, get a comprehension of how all of this happens. And if you will, allow me to interject, uh, because Brother Frank just did the communion with us a while ago. I, uh, last week, I was there in Georgia. Uh, I could not get a, a flight out early enough. And by the way, that, uh, that uh, plane ticket round trip was over $700. Uh, but I couldn't get a flight out early enough. And so I, I went to this congregation there in Brunswick where we had previously lived. I had a really good preacher friend, and one of the elders and I become really good friends. But when they took the little cup there, uh, like we did to, uh, today, they only had the one prayer for both the, the, the bread and for the fruit of the vine. And very honestly, I started thinking about that uh, a little bit later, and then just now, when Brother Frank was doing that, I went back and looked at Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse 26, and as I suspected, as I remembered, as I've quoted many times, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks, and then he took the cup and he gave thanks. It was two separate occasions, and that's the way, you know, there's the biblical precedent. Uh, it, may, it may be straining at gnats, but to me, it's a significant thing that we take the, uh, the extra time to say the prayer for each of these things. But Jesus says there that I am the prayer. As a matter of fact, I, I'll turn to the Exodus one, but I really want to read this because as I was preparing this lesson, I was noticing uh, the context, because, and I'll never forget this, when I was talking to Diane's mother many years ago, uh, Jesus, uh, my mother-in-law, mentioned from verse 29, this is where we can start, uh, Jesus says, it is, uh, <clears throat> verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent, uh, who he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign? so that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? He says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the, the true bread out of heaven. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Katie and Jake and Diane and I watched the, the movie The Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, in that movie, as you recall, uh, as a matter of fact, Jeremy, if I'm not mistaken, did you not build our Ark of the Covenant? The Bible, yeah. No, but what but, but, but little No, part? no, I did the Bible. Oh, okay. I, I knew you did that. I thought you might have done the son built it. Oh, awesome. Uh, beautiful. I didn't even notice it until one day I was walking back down that. And it's very, very uh, succinct, if you will allow me. You tell him I'm really proud of what he did with that. That was, that was a very awesome thing. But in that Ark of the Covenant, as you recall, there were three items. And one of those was that manna out of heaven, as you recall. And because God actually fed the children of Israel, which was a bread. And so Jesus uses that situation and that incident to remind them that God had provided bread for them. And interestingly enough, throughout the entire world, bread is a sustenance as it was there during that time. Uh, uh, he says, our fathers uh, ate the manna, verse 31, in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Uh, then he says, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and uh, gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us bread. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And so verse 35 of Matthew, uh, John chapter 6 is the first I am, of, if you will, here that we find in the Bible. I am the bread of life. Remember Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, and uh, Jesus tells them, he says, you know, if you're really, Satan says to Jesus, if you're really the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus reminds them about bread uh, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Uh, every sin, not just the bread, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Last night, as I was flying back from from Nashville to, to uh, uh, here uh, at, uh, in Chicago, uh, Midway. Uh, turns out I sat next to a, a lady who uh, claimed to be a minister uh, in Tinsley Park of all places. And we had a, a, an hour long talk. And uh, we were talking about you know different things that we read about in the Bible. And suffice it to say that, that uh, we, were, we even got into versions of the Bible and what have you. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, and, you know, when you've got an hour flight, you probably never get a chance to, to visit with this person again. You don't take a lot of time to, uh, to get in depth with the scriptures. But I thought about the fact that she, like so many people, if you'll allow me to say it this way, know just enough about the Bible to be dangerous. And, and, and it can be a very, very dangerous thing. And I think that's a powerful statement that Jesus made that, that, that we got to feed on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, the wise man Solomon said that thy word is a, la a, a, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. But uh, every word, of course, is important and, and it's, it's consistent with exactly what God would want us to do. And that's what we see here in John chapter 6, beginning with verse 29. We move on to our third point. And next week, we will pick up the other four. Now, for the record, if you want to go back and read it, three of the four are found in one verse. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The first one, as I said, was mentioned here in John chapter 6. The second one is John chapter 8 and verse 12. Um, Back in Matthew 5, when we were studying from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in verse 14, You are the light of the world. Remember that? A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Now in John chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. I want you to do me a favor, because we mentioned this a little bit just a while ago. I want you to go back to John chapter 1 with me. I want you to read with me beginning back uh, uh, in the very first few verses there of John chapter 1, because uh, after he mentioned in the beginning was the word, the word with the, 
uh, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, verse 2. All things came into, uh, into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. We all know that light is so critical in so many different ways, but one of the things we most know about light is that light gives life. You know, you can go out there the next week and you can plant your garden, and the next thing you know, we don't have a sunny day for three months, that garden's not going anywhere. God expects us to trust that light is provided by Him, you know, at the, the very, very beginning, um, when Diane used to teach the cradle roll, she would remind the kids about how that God created the sun, uh, and he said that it was good. There was a purpose for that, because that light is what sustains. Uh, I remember when I was studying this very, very deeply uh, as, a, as a student in school, and I remember us talking about all of the different things that lights do. Matter of fact, being a car guy, and you all know this, uh, there used to be a time, and there is uh, on some vehicles, a time where you had a gauge to give you an idea about uh, all the different systems in your car. But now, and you've probably heard the term, I know it's down in the south, I'm assuming it's up here too, we call them idiot lights, okay? These lights that decide to come on, you know, when something goes wrong with your car without giving you a lot of, a, of insight into exactly what it's all about. But those lights help us. They prepare us for being able to address that. We drive down the street, somebody's come up with the concept of the red, yellow, and green, and what each of those represent as we're traveling, knowing how the, we might be able to respond. Uh, have you ever thought of this? I'm sure many of you probably heard this term before. Many, many of the sins that people create are in darkness. Darkness is always, if you will, been stated in the sense of where sin exists. In him was life, and the light was the light of men, and the, uh, 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 and, uh, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus, of course, says, I am the light of the world. And he explains to us in that process that he illuminates each and every one of us. We have to, without a choice, be guided by our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, I'm going to give this lesson to you at this point. I think you've, you've seen the major points here about the, 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 the great I am of the Old Testament. As I said, uh, matter of fact, uh, there will actually be five that we'll pick up next week. Uh, I didn't want to start on John chapter 10 because that there's some 10 verses there uh, where Jesus says that I, I am the good shepherd. And I want us to look at this good shepherd in length uh, in John 15. Uh, he will also say, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. It's in 14, as I mentioned a while ago, in verse 6, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But once again, we see that Jesus is the great I am. One thing that was very important to me as I began this series today is that we don't get our eyes off Jesus. Remember when, she, uh, when, when Peter wanted to walk on water, and Jesus had walked on the water? And do you remember how that Peter uh, began to sink and asked Jesus to grab him? You know why? Because he took his, light, his, his eyes off Jesus. And in and, 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 and Hebrews chapter 12, seeing we're encompassed about verse 1 by so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin that this so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus. Once again, brother, don't take your eyes off Jesus. If in any way you might be subject to this invitation, come on together, we stand on the same.